Hi everybody, so this is the talk again dedicated to all you residents out there on the front line uh, working hard with COVID. This is on high yield tips for internal derangements uh, regarding knee radiographs. Um, the purpose of this talk is to give you an idea of high yield findings in knee radiographs and it's essentially for those situations where you're looking but you're not seeing anything or you see something subtle and you don't know what to make of it. I'm going to exclude the sections on tumors, infection and arthritis. We'll be talking about some common views and we'll go by a compartment wise approach. So the anterior compartment is a very common area to look especially in younger patients. There's a high incidence of patellofemoral problems and these are the key areas and abnormalities that we'll look for. The first thing that I find a lot of residents have difficulty finding is a joint effusion. If you look at the image on the left, in the suprapatellar pouch, you will see a small thin band of tissue, which is essentially the normal flattened synovium. If you look at the image on the right, which is actually marked R, what you will see is there's a more bulbous soft tissue there, as pointed out by this arrow. And this is essentially a suprapatellar effusion. And this is sort of the first sign that you have that there is an evidence of an internal derangement or something abnormal inside the joint. So the suprapatellar effusion and the joint effusion are a particularly important thing for you to identify. The next thing we look at is the patellar position. And here we want to see if the patella is low lying in our patella baja if it's high riding or a patella alta. And the way we do this is essentially by drawing a line that measures the length from the inferior pole of the patella to the tibial tuberosity, and then looking at the actual length of the patella itself. And normally these two numbers should fall between 20% of each other. If the patella is too low, then we call it patella baja. It's spelled B-A-J-A, -A, but it's pronounced B-A-H-A. -A. It's a, a Spanish word. And uh, the high riding patella is called patella alta or a high riding patella. Okay, these can be responsible for patellofemoral symptoms. Another thing about the patella position is when you look on the skyline view here, essentially you're trying to determine whether whether the patella is centrally located within the trochlear groove or not. And if you find that the patella is tilted, or usually it's tilted laterally down, then we call it a lateral patellar tilt. And if on the other hand, you find that the patella is actually moved laterally, then we call it a patellar shift. The next area to really focus your energies on is the inferior pole of the patella. It's a common area where you can see abnormalities. In young children, especially in acute situations, you may see something called a patellar sleeve avulsion. And in this case, what essentially happens is the patella uh, tendon avulses off the inferior pole of the patella and pulls a little bit of periosteum with it and this is called a patellar sleeve avulsion injury. In older people, what you will oftentimes see is either there is elongation of the inferior pole of the patella, or you will see fragmentation in something called syndic larsen johansson syndrome, and essentially changes along the superior and inferior pole of the patella are usually a reflection of patellar tendon or extensor overload. A common area to look for, especially in young children, is to look at the tibial tuberosity and how far is fat pad, especially if they have localized tenderness in, in this area. And if you see three common things, one is fragmentation of the tibial tuberosity, thickening of the patellar tendon towards the tibial tuberosity attachment, and edema or fat stranding in how far is fat pad, all these thing, three things together are seen with Oscott Schlatter's disease, which is essentially insertional tibial osteochondrosis. The problem is that oftentimes these changes may be seen without symptoms. So Oscott Schlatter's disease is often a clinical diagnosis with radiographic correlates. And alternatively, you may see all the radiographic findings, but no real clinical symptoms. The next place we're going to focus our attention is on the medial compartment. And here we look at the common abnormalities of the medial compartment. I think the first thing that I want to target here is the osteoarthritis. I see a lot of people overcalling osteoarthritis and uh, therefore there is an epidemic of osteoarthritis which is mostly created by radiologists and orthopedic surgeons. So the first thing you need to know here is, is the joint space narrowing real or are we just making it up? And the first way that you make this up is by looking at the obliquity. So if you look at the radiograph on the left, what you will see that there is apparent joint space narrowing. And if you look at the radiograph on the right, the joint space narrowing is not bad. But if you look a little bit further and you look at the articular surface of the medial tibial plateau, you will find that it is almost overlooking on the image on the left. And that is because of the obliquity. So you notice this, this uh, sort of oval appearance to this. 
The next thing that you look at in the opposite side is that oval appearance is much flatter. So the image on the left is a far more accurate interpretation of the joint space narrowing as opposed to the image on the right. And this essentially happens as a result of appropriate positioning when you are taking the radiograph. So if the knee is not appropriately positioned, you will get obliquity. And when you're looking at these radiographs, you need to be able to identify that. Another way of determining whether joint space narrowing is real or not is looking at a comparison radiograph. As people get older, this is obviously more difficult because you may have symmetric arthritis. But a comparison view is usually a great way to look for medial compartment narrowing, especially in patients who have unilateral symptoms. The third and probably one of the most important ways to look for joint space narrowing is to take note of the presence and absence of weight bearing. So the images on the left are of the knee radiograph of a patient when they were lying supine and you can see that the joint space narrowing is not so bad. But when you look at the images on the right, you can see that there's marked medial compartment narrowing more so on the left than the right. And this is basically because of the weight bearing. So a weight bearing radiograph is really important for you to look at whether or not there is real joint space narrowing. Now, once you're convinced about that, you can follow what's called a standardized Kelgen, Kelgren Lorentz scale, and you can grade the osteoarthritis from mild, moderate, and severe. So the key things to take home about the osteoarthritic component is, is it really osteoarthritis? And that you can do by checking the obliquity, looking at a comparison view, and weight bearing. So please be very careful before you start this ep epidemic of medial compartment osteoarthritis. And then once you're convinced it's real joint space narrowing, try and determine what grade it is. Other things we're going to see in the medial compartment, sometimes you will see something at the medial epicondyle, which is a small little area of ossification or calcification. If this is more acute with thickening of the medial collateral ligament, this can be an acute medial collateral ligament osseous avulsion or a Pellegrini steata lesion. If you see this more chronic sort of ossific appearance without thickening of the collateral ligament, then this could be a situation where somebody has a chronic MCL um, injury they could lead to chronic instability and then this could lead to chronic osteoarthritis. Rarely what we found in some of these cases is that there is just localized intense tenderness over there which comes on very suddenly in which case it ends up being an acute calcific tendinitis or calcific periarthritis. So this is an important area for you to look at. Uh, the next thing is the osteochondritis dissecans lesion. Now this is most commonly seen at the inner aspect of the medial femoral condyle as a small lucency. So it's important to identify this. When you do identify this, sometimes you can see it better when you do a flexed uh, PA view because this can show the lesion better in the inner aspect of the medial femoral condyle like you see it here. And then sometimes you can be lucky enough to see the displaced osteochondritis dissecans fragment. So that's an important area to look at in especially your young patients with knee pain. The next thing that you need to be aware about is this small little ovoid osseous body that you can oftentimes see in the inner aspect of the medial femoral compartment. And this, if it is an ovoid well circumscribed osseous body, ends up being what's called a meniscal ossicle. And there you have it over here and here. So this is fairly common, a meniscal ossicle. One last area that I see residents sometimes getting confused is looking at the fabella, which is essentially an accessory bone, which is usually in the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. And that ends up being called a loose body. So this here is the fabella. And you should be quite careful because it can have a fairly varied appearance. And be careful not to call that a loose body. Moving on from there to the lateral and intercondylar compartments. Uh, one, this is a nice case that I like to show uh, residents and fellows all the time. And the, the, because there are three findings here that are very, very helpful. So the first thing you notice is that there is an osseous aversion or irregularity of the tibial eminence in the midline. The second thing you notice is some osseous flakes near the lateral femoral condyle. And the third thing you notice is this very, very subtle slender flake of bone that is near the lateral tibial plateau. And essentially when you look at this, what this tells you is because there is this tibial eminence uh, osseous avulsion, this is typically related to the ACL. And whenever you're looking at the ACL, the next thing you're concerned about is the posterolateral lateral corner. And so you can see these two little accessory flakes of bone here, which are essentially avulsions of the popliteus and fibular collateral ligament. And last but not least, you see this Sigon fracture, which is an anterior capsular attachment of the anterolateral ligament. So here on a radiograph, without doing an MRI even, you already know this is an ACL injury, which is likely to have posterolateral corner instability and even anterolateral instability to some extent. So this you can see confirmed, the subtle um, Sigon fracture on the um, 
you can see all these three findings on the CT and this is the subsequent MRI where you can see the typical translational bone marrow edema pattern from an ACL injury and along with that you can see uh, osseous avulsion of the tibial attachment of the ACL with the ACL ligament itself looking intact as well as osseous avulsion of the fibular collateral ligament and popliteus. Okay. Another subtle finding of ACL injury is the deep sulcus sign and essentially here what you can see on the image on the left is there's depression of the lateral sulcus terminalis of the femur which you don't see on the image on the right and this is a subtle finding and comparative views are helpful. Sometimes you can find the subtle finding on both sides so don't bank everything on this but it's a good clue that something could be wrong with the ACL. Another subtle clue of ACL abnormality is when you see anterior tibial translation and when you want to look at that essentially you can draw a line that parallels the patellar tendon and along with it a line that parallels the anterior cortex of the tibia above the tibial eminence and this V that you get over here in a patient with tibial translation will get uh, narrowed and so narrowing of that angle is oftentimes a good clue that somebody could have anterior tibial translation and anterior cruciate ligament insufficiency. Getting on to the last issue, which is the posterior, uh, posterior cruciate ligament, these injuries tend to be fairly innocuous. Patients have the injury, get up and walk off, um, and then they present after a while saying that they've got chronic leg pain so here or knee pain. And here the important thing is to look very carefully for a subtle osseous avulsion of the posterior cruciate ligament, which you can see over here, and the comparative view on the left where you don't really see that. The other way to look for posterior cruciate ligament laxity, because oftentimes we don't have an osseous avulsion, is to do a flexed weight-bearing view, essentially where you flex as, as somebody is sitting at 90 degrees, kneeling on a chair, and you can compare both sides. And what you're essentially looking to see if the femur is moving downwards in relation to the tibia. So here you can see on the image on the left, the femur has, uh, sorry, the image to my right. You, uh, so you can see the image on the left where you can see that the line that goes through the tibia so the central shaft of the tibia essentially intersects the patella, whereas the one on the opposite side, which is to the right, uh, goes above the patella, indicating that there is inferior migration of that femoral distal femur and indicating that the PCL is lax and there is posterior laxity. So in summary, what we've done is we've looked at some high yield radiographic tips for internal derangements. We've learned how to look for joint effusions, which is an important clue. We've learned to assess the medial compartment and discuss the importance of not overcalling medial compartment osteoarthritis. We've discussed the issues of young patients and the patellofemoral compartment as well as the OCD lesions. We've talked about the ACL findings which are the Sigon fracture, the Crista terminalis depression, the posterolateral corner injuries and ways to look for anterior translation. We've talked about the medial collateral ligament and the Pellegrini stiata lesion as well as calcific tendinosis or calcific periarthritis. And last but not least, we've talked about the posterior cruciate ligament, bony avulsions, as well as translation of the tibia. So with that, I'll stop this. I hope you guys stay safe and I hope this helps you a lot. Thank you.